Okay, cool. So, okay, it's four. I mean, so, so I'll start whenever, whenever you tell me it's okay to start. Oh, whenever. Okay. All right, are you, are you five happy with me? So I, I wasn't sure how many people would come because it was... Happy. Okay, because like I was, I, you know, I, I, I asked my PhD students if, if they wanted this and, you know, they said they would be interested in doing it because especially people who are writing papers for the first time or early times. And then, you know, I, I, then my, my head went in this very snarky direction as it always does and I showed some people a, a mock abstract and others from both UCLA and elsewhere expressed interest. So I'm like, okay, well, I can do another one. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what this is. But then, uh, yeah, we probably should. And then the thing is, of course, because it's Friday afternoon, I'm yeah. also, uh. you know, Friday, Friday afternoon from four, at four o'clock is, is probably not the most, um, that probably does not encourage attendance as much as other things do, but that's fine. So anyway, but we, we got this room just because it's easier if we're in the room. And um, I'm hoping this will be as much tutorial and discussion. I have a bunch of slides. We don't need to go through all of them, but I would really like to be able to you know, answer questions that are helpful, have discussions and so on. Okay, and um, I've sent you the slide share, so you also have access to that both now and later. You're also welcome to ask me stuff. You know, uh, some question might show up, show up later. Um, you might, you know, disagree on some things. That's also perfectly fine. I mean, this, you know, so, you know, questions and discussions and participation. Um, you know, I actually now I wonder if the beginning of the video is going to have Dungeons and Dragons discussions. Who knows? But anyway, um, interrupt. Most of you are good at interrupting. I've had all of you yeah. in my class oh. before, so, so I think I think you're all all good at interrupting. Um, and then one of the things that happened when I did this with 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 my PhD students a couple of weeks ago, and will probably also happen now. I'm sure there's stuff I didn't think of, right? So that, so there, so you know emails that say you should create a slide about you know whatever topic that's not there are good because I can always add to it. Um, my style. Okay, you, you or you five are probably not ones who need to hear this, but you know my style is a bit different from the norm scientifically, and this this extends to how I write my paper. So there'll be some stuff that'll be different from what you're used to seeing. Um, but you know, if you're going to break the rules, the only way to effectively break the rules, and you can of course decide for yourselves whether I do that effectively, is to know what the rules are in the first place, um, for whatever that means. Okay, so I want to give a few resources, and some of them maybe you've already looked at. Um, and this is one reason why I also gave the slides, because you don't want people like scribbling stuff. Um, Peter Dodds, who's, who's in complex systems, also in a math department at Vermont, has, and he, his, um, actually his wife's a sci-fi writer, so he has his feet both in, um, both in, um, in, in sci-fi and in, and in science, but he talks about stories a lot. Vermont, they have the story lab. So, so he has this, his essay about a narrative hierarchy, and, and the idea is that you have storytelling when you write, right? So it's a story based on facts, but it's, it's still a story, right? There's a sort of the big picture facts, there's where it fits in to other literature, there's the how do you specifically go about something in the big picture in the first place, right? So there, there is this notion of a hierarchy. And actually when you're drafting papers, like I, I recommend to my students, okay, let's first make an outline, then let's put like one sentence in each outline just saying what's in each subsection, saying what's gonna be there, what figure you plan to be there. And we, and, and, you know, we give them comments at a sort of high level and we kind of narrow down from there, right? There's this notion of hierarchy and how we do it. And at the very end, the comments you get are like micro, right? And uh, you, know, you get really super micro comments eventually at the end. Um, okay, so anyway, so Peter Dodds wrote that. Um, Stephen Kranz, this is the second edition of a very well-known um, well book. There is actually a free version of it on the archive, and you, or you can buy it for a cheap price. Um, the older one's from like 20 years ago, so, so stuff like blogging and other more modern things are only gonna be, and social media are only gonna be in the more recent one. Um, it's a little bit more geared towards pure mathematics, but there's a lot of cool, good stuff in it, a lot of stuff that's worth looking at, so I recommend that. Um, I know less about this reference, but one of my collaborators, Mariano Begaris Diaz, told me about it, and he recommends it highly, so that's another one. This is not geared towards mathematics per se, so it might be more general in that respect. Um, this is a recent article in the notices of the AMS, um, and it's actually talking more to pure mathematicians, but a lot of these, even though I'm framing it more for applied mathematicians, a lot of these things also fit in there. 
Um, and the quote I like is a paper should have an informative introduction. So, you know, if you read some papers, they start saying, oh, we'll let A be an algebra. Okay, well, why? <laughs> and it's fine, so maybe there should be a page that says, well, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it. The why could, me, could be a purely mathematical reason, right? We could be trying to prove a certain theorem because this would give a connection between a certain idea in algebra and a certain idea in geometry, right? So, so even in pure mathematics, there's still going to be a reason you're trying to do something. Right. Yeah, please. So, um, when I was first learning how to write, and this isn't about like technical writing or scientific writing, just writing in general. Sure. I mean, so, so my mom suggested I read the book Elements of Style by Strunk and White. Right? I've heard of it. I've never read it. Oh. Is it good? Oh. Yeah, good. And so I like it a lot. It's very it's short. It's the same. And so, as far as I understand it, it was given, it was like circulated as part of like a newspaper. Mm -hmm. How to write in a way that's succinct and lets normal people understand it. Right. So, yeah, so, so that's important. Yeah. Um, and then let's normal people understand it, at least to the extent possible. Yeah. Clarity, I mean, you know, um, somebody who's a poet is not going to emphasize clarity necessarily, right? They're going to emphasize somehow writing being beautiful, mm -hmm. right? And it could also be clear. And our writing can also be beautiful, but we're going to emphasize clarity, mm -hmm. right? I mean, um, yeah, so that's a good suggestion. Um, my own background, actually, I was a co-editor of the college newspapers. This going to a small university helps with that. But having experience with journalism actually really helps a lot with science writing because you need to get to the point and get people's attention before they go away really fast. Um, okay, and then, uh, yeah, so thank you for that source and that's, you know, along the lines of this comment there. This is not meant to be exhaustive, it's just meant to be some things. Could you, um, if you don't mind emailing me a reference to that and then, I don't know if I'll add it to the slides, but I'd at least like to have, you know, I'd like to remember it at least. Okay, um, so, I mean, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to not just be for applied math, but I, you know, it just gives a concrete framing. Um, informative introductions also applies to pure mathematics. Um, I think it can be even more important for us in applied math because we're typically touching on a larger number of very disparate things. If I am studying a model of social influence, um, even if I'm going to publish it in an applied math or a physics journal, it would be nice at some point if somebody who is a stakeholder, in so, you know, who study a sociologist, at least thinks my paper is worth looking at. Because if I, if I as a mathematician study, you know, social influence and only do it for other mathematicians, am I actually studying social influence? So it's not that I would write the same paper as a sociologist would, but in principle, there should at least be some stuff in my paper, even if it's mostly confined to the introduction, abstract, and conclusions, that people who are stakeholders might want to read to have some idea of what I think I did. Okay, does that make sense? You know, so that's a broader set than I think somebody from pure mathematics would do, where they would more touch on different areas of mathematics rather than different areas of scholarship. Um, so, so the audience will get very diverse. And also, when you're trying to place what you do you know, in, in context of what others have done, there's both more diversity in the backward direction and in the forward direction. So if I'm modeling a certain phenomenon, I might well, I might well review or at least survey different things that people in the field have found, different um, ways that it's been abstracted by theoreticians, different techniques that are used to solve the equations that get abstracted, and then I might have conclusions that touch on, on some subset or many subsets of those. Do you, do you see what I mean? It's like you should think of, I have many edges, well, I mean, you're all, you've all taken the networks course, but I have many edges coming in and, you know, many edges, you know, going out. Um, okay, so applied mathematics, more than most other fields, has this showing up in most papers. And eventually you get to the more specific stuff with the results, but you want to at least give people an idea of where, where it fits in. So then it'll depend on which journal you put it in as well. Um, Another thing that will happen with applied mathematicians, most applied mathematicians are going to be writing papers for a very broad variety of journals. I mean, I publish stuff in applied math journals, and in physics journals, and in computational biology journals, and in sociology journals, and you know, all of you are gonna be doing things like that, and depending on the journal you put it in, your audience is gonna be a bit different. Style might be a bit different. Sometimes even imposed. But okay, so what is in a paper? Um, blood, sweat, tears, and since I'm the one presenting and since I write also snark, um, there might be a subtitle, subtitled possibly with a subtitle. Uh, clearly there's going to be an abstract. 
Most journals require keywords. Um, I don't think they all do. How useful they are is a bit debatable. Sometimes they're useful. Sometimes you just kind of have to tick the box and they force you to do it. In principle, it should help with searching. In practice, I don't know. Um, subject classification codes, which I consider more serious than keywords in terms of practical utility, is, you know, because it's actually an ontology. And then depending on the journal, you might use the MSC numbers for math. You might use, um, it's now phys tech, because physics has changed it, but you might use the physics classification. Um, Association for Computation and Machinery has one as well. So if you're doing certain types of computation ones, you might be using ACM codes. Um, those are relevant. I mean, you also use those on job applications, right? You're forced to in math. So, okay, so they have those. Obviously, as an introduction, various intermediate sections, which could get further subdivided. Um, rarely, and I have one example up here, although we may not end up going through it, but you can look at that paper. Introductions can also have subsections that's sometimes frowned upon, but if it ends up getting large, it can also be useful. So I do it sometimes. Um, Right, and these various sections could have background, could have different types of methodology. So you might well have bi biolog biological background, statistics background, right? There might be more than one background section depending on what you have to draw from. Um, again, these are things that I think applied mathematicians might have to deal with in a more, in a more serious way sometimes than some others. Um, there might be various types of results sections and applications and case studies and whatever. Um, this paragraph, and it's not that I never do this. In fact, I think I'll show you an example in which I do it a little bit. I prefer not to when possible, but some journals, especially like the, uh, some of the biology journals will actually force this. You have to have a section that says results. You have to have a section that says methods and so on. And so, you know, worst case scenario, you can do this dry thing that's introduction, results, methods, conclusions, uh, bibliography, and whatever. Um, I prefer to be more descriptive when I can. I cannot always think of a better way, but this is a default that will tend to that will tend to be okay. So what's non-descriptive about the standard? Well, okay, so there's a couple things. One is that result, there might be more than one flavor of results, or I may want to split things into case studies instead. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. I mean, results can at least be subdivided, mm -hmm. but, but I may want to do it into case studies, or I may want to separate numerics from, from asymptotics. Um, you know, so it just prevents me from making other choices that for a given paper I may decide are better. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, I mean, this is more for biology, not for, not for math, but the, they usually do the results before the methods. And I find that very difficult for mathematics because, you know, you want to define certain things to even understand the results in the first place. Or in mathematics, it might well be that the methods actually are the results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For short papers, like science papers, yeah. this would just don't have space for results. Yeah, yeah, for science papers. But there are some biology journals, uh, I think PLOS Comp Bio, which even demands a certain structure. It has to be a certain way. And you can monkey with it a little bit by having like a result subsection that's numerics and then analytics. Some, some of them, some journals actually do have a specific thing for different subsections that they demand and you have to do it that way because it's their style and you have no choice. And I find that the, the enforcing it is a bit more difficult for mathematics than others. The methods could be actually the main part of my paper, right? I mean, maybe the technique that we developed to prove a certain thing is much more important than the thing that we actually proved. You know, I mean, that, that's common, right? I mean, for us, it's common. For biology, for biologists, sometimes methods are just a nuisance. You know, we wanted to study something in a reasonable way, and what we actually care about is what we found at the end, not how we got there. So I think, I think here there, the difference between fields, I think, does show up. Okay, so there'll be a conclusions and a discussion. Conclusions is not just an abstract written in past tense, if they're written well. You know, you want to say big picture, what did you find? Here are some specific things you did. Where would you go next? Um, again, ideally, I mean, th these things all vary. And then, okay, well, of course, acknowledgments. Um, maybe you'll have appendices. Maybe you'll have even supplementary material, not cool enough even for an appendix. Um, um, of course, okay, references, just as a note, these aggregators make all sorts of errors. So usually you either do it manually, or if you use an aggregator, you go back and fix it manually because of all the errors they make. Um, you know, the, the errors are egregious enough that you can look at a bibliography that if someone hasn't gone through it manually, you can figure out and reverse engineer which aggregator they used. Is an aggregator just like oh, a check or 
no, no, not like BibTeX, because BibTeX more of, I, I mean more like Mendeley or, or what are the other ones? Ugh. Like you can use them to essentially, in, a, in an online way, it's almost like a social network where, you, where instead of tagging pictures, you say, I'm interested in this article, and then this also has a bib entry associated with it that's done in some automated way. So, so the idea is that these are automated bib entries, and they tend to be full of errors. Okay. I have papers that apparently start from page zero in journals that don't exist, according to that. And I have seen published papers cite my work in that way. I have one paper that's been cited in at least a couple dozen distinct ways because of distinct aggregators. Like maybe aggregator may not be the right word, given, given your question. Um, Okay, and then other things that we try to aim to do, it will sometimes depend on, on privacy considerations for data, but to the extent possible, make data public, make code public, make, make outputs of computation public, you know, as much stuff as you can make public in terms of duplicating your work as, as you know, feasible. Um, you know, also, when you, know, when you write something, you try to write down every micro detail, but you know, you've been ingrained in this problem for a while, you might forget that a micro detail matters, right? And you might go through many, many drafts of the paper with your, with your co-authors, and you might forget that it matters. The one nice thing about having this stuff available in public is that if you happen to forget to write something down, because we're humans, we might do that, then the direct comparisons there, it's available, right? Even if we forget to put something in the paper. So to the extent possible, I know there's various considerations. Some data has to be private. Sometimes you work with a company and you know, no way can you put that up. Um, sometimes you have a choice between making your code good enough for public consumption and graduating, and then if you're going to industry, that code may not ever be public, right? Because if you have to choose between those, well, you should graduate. Um, okay, so there are nested storytelling hierarchies. So I mentioned Peter Dodds again, so this paper, how the paper fits in with other papers, but sections and subsections and sub-subsections paragraphs, sentences, phrases, and words and punctuation, and the revisions that you do with your co-authors will kind of start big and go tiny. And as, as those of you who've been writing papers with me know, I go down to the last punctuation mark eventually. Um, not in the first draft, well, okay. I try not to do it in the first draft, but I have this inner, this inner need to correct punctuation that, that sometimes I cannot resist, but you know, eventually we get to that point. Um, okay, what came before? We talked about that, what came afterwards. Related work is kind of the sideways one. You're not going to be able to cite everything that you might want to because, you know, then you could have a paper that has citations and nothing else. So there is some judgment involved and different people make the choice at different places. In pure mathematics, the number of citations tends to be much smaller. Like, I think, I know some pure mathematicians who will only cite a paper if they actually used a result in it. So I don't agree with that threshold because if a paper helped you understand something, even if you don't use a result in it, I think you should cite that paper because it helped you understand something. But the, you know, there are bars at different levels and different people have different bars. I tend to be pretty generous because I think that's helpful for readers. But you look like you might have a question. I'm just thinking, I mean, that what you're saying makes sense if you think of a citation as being like a reward for helping out. Right. Wait, which, well, the, and, and, and it should be, if you want, if that paper is useful and you want them to write it. Sure, sure. I mean, I'm not disagreeing right, with you, yeah. but I'm just saying from a pure math perspective, but also it makes sense, like, as a, as like, you know, um, it makes another kind of sense, right, where they, I guess maybe aren't thinking that our citation is like a reward for writing a paper, but rather like just, like helps people do like a, right. like almost like a hypertext link. Right, right, exa exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, but then, you know, then, then the context within the paper, the way you would phrase it, you would, fr you would also phrase it in a way that gives the context. You, would, you could say, for an illuminating discussion of this related topic, see blah, right? Whereas you're saying, I'm going to use theorem 2.1 from, from somewhere else, you know, or I'm going to adapt the argument from somewhere else, right? You, 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 can, give, you can give context. I mean, it is true that their bar tends to be higher for this because it's just a, it's a, it's a cultural thing. Um, I tend to try to be on the generous side. Of course, you know, there'll be people out in you know, Twitterverse watching this, they're like, that bastard Mason didn't cite me, even though he just said he's generous. So, you know, I'll get hate mail and, and so on. Um, you do the best you can, ultimately. There is a judgment, though, right? I mean, it's not going to be possible to cite every possible thing. So there, there is a judgment. Um, okay, so I've mentioned this. You're telling a story. It's a factual story, but it's still a story. What is the moral of the story? Think of the moral as the main conclusion. Um, why is it important? Okay, so you know, why are you writing the paper? 
when you, you know, and, 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 and the people reading this should be able to look at like the abstract and figure out, okay, maybe I agree, maybe I don't agree, but this is why they felt that they should write the paper. Right, that should come across. Um, how does it change what was there before? Where am I to go in the future? Right, I mean, um, now this one, okay, I have an analogy here. The first analogy will make more sense than the second, I think, because the second one's gonna involve me explaining, you know, songs that some people don't know, um, some of which are obscure, but I like doing that. Um, how is it different and similar from the morals of other stories related work? So the idea being that, okay, so I think that Romeo and Juliet versus West Side Story is, is, a, is a legitimately good analogy because it, you know, it's one is based on the other story, but there must have been some reason to create the second one in the first place. So there's something that, you, that, that at least the people creating it thought you would, and I think correctly in this case, thought you would get from the second one that wasn't already there in the first one. Oh, well, okay, maybe you don't mind. Um, <laughs> West Side Story is essentially this story, but it's set in New York, and I believe one family is, is Puerto Rican, and one family is oh. from New York. What's that? Were you in the idea? No, I know West Side Story. Too. No, but, but it's, it's essentially this story in a more modern setting, and part of the reason to, get to make the point is that this issue is still relevant in the modern setting, and it's relevant for people from different sets of ethnicities. Oh. So, so the idea is, this story is still relevant beyond this one because there's something that the difference adds that's not already there. Okay, I won't bother explaining. It'll take longer to explain the analogy. Like American gay and a Puerto Rican gay. Uh, yeah, I, I got the idea. Too. Yeah, no, but the, the point is, it, it, it really is essentially the Romeo and Juliet story, but in a different setting, and the different setting gives you something. Um, and then, okay, back to the more scientific one. I might be studying opinion dynamics. I'm going to make choices in, in you know, specific things that I do. Maybe I want the opinion spaces to be minus one and one and discrete, or maybe I want it to go be con continuum between minus one and one. And I might be trying to get at a very similar sociological phenomenon, maybe. And I have a different mathematical way that I choose to do it, perhaps, right? But, but you, you know, if, I'm, if I start by saying I'm going to study this application, of course, that's not how all applied math papers start. Sometimes you start by saying I can improve this numerical method or I can improve this asymptotic method or whatnot. But sometimes you say I'm interested in this application. I want to abstract it so that I have a math problem that I can, that I can do something with. I'm going to now have to make choices. There will be consequences of those choices. I may want to write multiple papers or other people will also write papers where in different papers I make different choices. So I view that in some ways as analogous to Romeo and Juliet and West Side Story. It's telling the same story in some sense, but maybe if you look at it a different way, there's something new you can learn by it. Okay, so yeah. I'm trying to resist the urge to go into you know, 80s music, but um, anyway, so in this slide I've posted before, but um, I don't think this is needed for, for, for U5, but I mean, there's a lot of papers out there where clearly there are people who could who could learn something from the slide. But you, though you're telling a story, you know, no bullshit, back everything up, you know, when you have an opinion, it's not that you can't have an opinion, right? Now, and I don't mean even conjecture, could be, could be softer than a conjecture. You might have some feeling from your intuition or you might think that something will be true but you can't even make it a conjecture. But you just make it clear that, look, here's the reason I think it's true. What's that? Okay. Um, okay, and yeah, so anyway, so, in a sense, it's obvious, but if you read a bunch of papers, you're going to find a lot of papers that I think break this. So what's an example of something that's like somewhat close to being on the line of bullshit or not bullshit that you would say is unacceptable? Um, that's harder to do, but okay. So let me tell you where the problem becomes mm -hmm. most difficult to figure out. Okay, you, you, know, you send something to say one of these fancy journals, mm -hmm. and the fancy journals it almost feels like they require you to BS, but you shouldn't do it anyway. Like, like, essentially, like the idea of hype. Like, you know, if, if you say, you know, our, our study may do whatever, you know, may lead to blah, blah, blah. You know, those statements very quickly can become hyperbolic. And, and you, know, you, you know, you want to explain why your paper is not incremental, but, but somehow this notion of, you know, may lead to curing cancer or, or whatnot. So, so when you're sending it to a fancy journal and somehow have to get them to consider it in the first place, I think that's where towing the line becomes very difficult. I, what I try to do, is that I try to explain why I think the problem is important. You kind of want to do it like you write a recommendation letter. When you write a recommendation letter, you know, you know, you have to be honest about people. 
you can't just say, oh, this is the best person ever. Um, I mean, okay, unless it actually is the best person ever. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, you know, the there's sort of an, inf there's, a, there, there's like an inflation in, in, in reference letters where, where people make it, you know, every, 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 every mathematician who's applied for a job here is the next field medalist. And if you read some of the reference letters, it sometimes feels that way. Um, but the, the idea is that you want to give facts and you want the facts to tell the story. And ideally, the, the facts should stand out as being, you know, really good enough to be in those things. So your question is very good. Um, and there is a towing the line in a sense. Um, I try to be very conservatively on one part of the line. I can't say that I always succeed. Um, okay, I'm clearly not going to answer the phone right now. Um, but you know, the, 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 if you're writing for an archival journal, usually you're very safe because you can just say, "Here's what I did, and here's what I learned, and that's you know what we want to do, and that's what I, that's what I prefer to do. That's what I'm most comfortable doing." For a fancy journal where you need to get them considering, you have to to consider it. You have to somehow indicate, you know, what are these sort of good things that could eventually arise, and so on. And that's when you have to be really careful. And I would rather just say, "Here's why I think the problem's important," or "This is a step towards." blah, 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 but a step towards, you know, is, is trying to put in this element of conservatism. Um, but yes, it's when you're, for, for those sorts of journals, it's hard. And sometimes it feels like, sometimes it feels like your paper won't even consider it unless you, you know, take steps you don't want to take. I think you should just not take those steps, honestly. Um, I, th I, think, I think you can let the facts tell the story. And the facts, if they are powerful facts, can tell a good story. And, and I can't promise that you won't look at everything I wrote and feel that I was on the wrong side of the line for some statement I made, right? Like, I, I cannot promise that you would agree with me in that thing. Um, I've, had many, um, I've had many papers that I've co-authored with people who are, like, and, and people in mathematics have it easy in a sense. We have fewer demands on us to do stuff like this than people in biology do, right? So the pressure's on us. You know, it's, it's a lot easier for me to make this statement being a professor in a math department than it would be, say, being in a biology department. Does that, does that make sense? It's just... I'm in a position where I have more of a luxury of making this, this statement. Um, but I've, you know, I've written papers with people in various fields, and I've, I've had situations where they keep sexing things up, and I keep sexing them down, and then I read papers that they write without me, and I just cringe when I read the stuff they write without me. But then the stuff that I write with them probably is written in a way that's maybe a little bit less down to earth than the stuff I write on my own, because it has the influence of multiple people. So, but, but yeah, I would go back to the let the facts tell the story, but you know, you indicate you know the lead of what you, you indicate why you personally think it's important, right? Because presumably, if you're submitting it to a fancy place, there's a reason that you think it should be there beyond the fact that it will help your career to be there, but that you actually think it deserves to be there, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't submit it there. Yeah. And then, and then you have to tell them the reason that you think it's important, and whether or not that convinces them is another story. But what you write should be something that you believe. Even if somebody else thinks you're, okay, you may not think it's BS. Somebody else might think it's BS. But what you write should be something you believe. And then you should separate what is a fact from what's an opinion. Okay, so we'll see. Yeah, when I wrote this on, uh, when I put this slide on Twitter, there was one person who, um, well, I didn't end up answering it. And then before I could even think about whether I was going to, he already deleted his tweet, but asked, are you 100% innocent on that? Um, yeah, well, I didn't answer because and then the thing got deleted. I didn't do that, so I don't know if somebody else contacted them, them and so on. But I know you're out there. No. Anyway, um, all right. So what if we're starting out? We start out with a sort of shell. I mean, ever, different people do it differently, but I'm kind of phrasing it this way because this is how I kind of think of things and, and how I would, you know, how I can, you know, do things with students and hopefully it'll be beneficial to them. Usually you try and attempt an abstract. Some, some people don't want to do that till later sometimes. And, and you might not even have all your results. So there's going to be some placeholders. You know, so, so in a sense, there might be, we do this calculation, but, 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 you, but you, know, you may still say, and we show that, well, we have to still figure out what we actually show because we don't understand it well enough yet. You know, so there might be placeholders. Um, and then you, you, you have some opinion about what sections you'll have. This could change over time. And you put a sentence saying what you think will be there. So the sentence might not even be a statement of results. The sentence might be results about what, you know, whatever I get from my asymptotic calculation or, or whatever it is. Um, but it'll give some idea. And then maybe a sentence indicating what figures you think we'll have. 
Um, possibly even draft versions of the figure depends on where you are. But the idea is that, you know, so suppose I'm in, I don't know, section two where I state what the problem is. Maybe, maybe section one, I, I give the introduction. And so in section two where I state what the problem is, I might say for the figure, I will have a schematic that helps illustrate the formulation of the problem which you won't always have, but if I have a, a reasonably complicated model, if we think of some of these, um, oh, I'm trying to remember good ones from networks, but I mean, okay, again, these social influence models, maybe I would, I would have some idea of, of, of what the update rule is and what the initial conditions are or whatnot. I mean, it, you won't always need it. It depends. You, you know, if you get something from, from, from physics, it's, if you get, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're studying, you know, a, a double or a triple pendulum, maybe you would have a force diagram. Right, because you're doing the force balance to get the equations in motion. Um, okay. Um, yeah, this is something for what with your co authors. If something really is a placeholder while you're drafting a paper, it's useful in some way to say that it's a placeholder so that, for example, people already know that it's not totally polished yet. Um, and then you gradually fill in more, and then I attempt if you're somebody working with me, to give big picture feedback. Attempt to resist the urge to point out missing commas in the very first draft. I'm not always successful at this. Um, but, but the idea is that you, you, know, in, you try to do this hierarchy where you do the really big picture stuff. You know, do I agree with how the sections are organized if I'm working with a student? You know, do I agree with the choice of figures? Do I think a figure is missing? Um, the other advantage of, of doing some of this stuff, or the other advantage, one advantage of doing some of this stuff even before um, maybe all the calculations are done is that in the process of writing a paper, you might find gaps in your story that you didn't realize are there. That you might be like, you know, I thought that I had a complete story, but actually I really feel like I need to do this other numerical simulation to shore something out. And it, it's the process of trying to write it that sometimes helps make you realize that there's something there that you need to do. I mean, you're nodding. So this is this is consistent with your experience, then? Yeah, um, yeah. They, because um, if you think about writing as, I mean, I think people, some some people, many people think writing as like a time-consuming process. Well, yes. But <laughs> then you know, before you reach that absolute amount of correcting for uh, punctuations, that you know, when you are really, you know, I say, oh, this there's something maybe worth publishing. You write down something. You're like, oh, actually, I can do that. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's a common. Yeah. I, I mean, the other thing I've noticed, um, and not with every student, but with some students, um, sometimes they don't yet realize they have enough for a paper. You know, you have a little result here, you have a little result there, and you have a lot of struggle in between. You know, when do you have enough that you say, oh, this is a contribution to the literature that should go out there? And that's also one of these fuzzy things. But I, I feel like some students need to be encouraged to write things down so that they realize that they produce something, you know, that together gives gives you something that's worth worth showing people. Exactly. Um, yeah, and then um, so this is consistent with that nested hierarchy, um, and then almost always there's a few exceptions. I will eventually even go through the source file myself and do stuff, and this forces me to look at it in detail, and I will find stuff, sometimes I go through multiple times, and I'll find stuff that, you know, either I'll understand how to fix it and fix it on my own, or I'll understand how to fix it, but I think the student will learn something by fixing it, or I just won't be able to figure out what the student's saying, and I'll be like, okay, look, I don't know what you're saying, you know, and, and we'll go through iterations. And eventually, after much blood, sweat, and tears, and snark, we will have a paper that we submit. Okay, so when I, when I thought about doing this, the first thing my head did is that I went into horrible snark mode and went to one of my papers to the point that I actually <laughs> forgot to, I accidentally deleted the UCLA affiliation instead of the Oxford one, because that paper had both. Um, and I wrote an abstract that, um, and I don't want to go and read through it because you can, you can read on your own. Um, but what I did with this is that I took one of my own papers and I wrote an abstract with like the cadence of that paper um, of, of that. So, you know, you've got your title and your affiliations. You know, we study a phenomenon that we claim is important. Hopefully it actually is. In a study in which we claim many people are interested. Hopefully they actually are. And go on from there. Anyway, you can read it. Um, you could also, and Aaron Closet gave me this suggestion, 
maybe it should have a subtitle, especially if it's computer science. You know, computer science paper, you need subtitle, acronym, um, possibly cherry-picked metric, possibly cherry-picked data, your data to be higher than the other, then you can publish. But make sure you have a good acronym. They're not all like that, but there's enough that that's the particular way that you can make fun of them. Um, anyway, title of a paper, pithy, clever, and short, ideally. Uh, and I corrected my affiliation. I'm actually wearing an Oxford shirt today after all that, uh, just to confuse things further. Okay, so I actually created that from one of my own papers um, because the easiest way to do satire is to start with an original source. Now, this abstract is actually longer than I prefer to do. I sometimes do abstracts that are too long. I usually caution against making the abstract this long. Um, and in fact, one of the comments uh, you know, that I have on the paper that we were, the bike paper that we were just discussing, the abstract of that is actually too long at the moment. Um, but I say that without having read it just by looking at the block of text. Anyway, um, again, I won't go through the full abstract because you can read it, um, but I will go through different things in this paper. And there's several things that I actually did in this paper that are a bit different from usual. My introductions tend to be longer than those of other people. I do consider that a feature rather than a bug. This one I went a bit overboard, I would say. Our introduction's even longer than I usually do, and it's rather at the extreme end. And um, I think it was justified, but it's definitely longer than what you normally want to do. Um, same thing with the conclusions. Um, OK, so maybe at some point look at this abstract and that one side by side. The, 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 satire, the satirical abstract does actually have the right cadence because, well, I took it from an actual abstract. Um, OK, and I will go through more about some of the stuff in that paper because that's one of the examples. Um, you know, perhaps ironically taking one of my examples from a physics journal initially rather than an applied math journal. Um, okay, so who's your audience? I think that's worth bringing up again. Um, so for a typical applied math paper, you will get smart mathematicians, some of whom will be from your field, some of whom will even be from your subfield, but others will have more basic background but not actually be experts in your sub area. So maybe one example in networks, there might be people who are experts in computational linear algebra who might be looking for other computational linear algebra problems to solve but are not in networks. They will read some of my networks papers and some of those eventually will start working on networks. Um, of course, if you do it for, if you send it to Siam Review, broad Siam audience. So that's really, that's really broad. But let's suppose I send it to, you know, Siam Journal of Applied Dynamical Systems. And I'm going to give another example that comes from um, that comes from that journal journal later. You need to write for the audience of that paper or that journal, not just the subset of the audience for that journal who work on your area. Okay, so this would be people who are broadly knowledgeable in applied math and dynamical systems. So core type courses that they might have to take in a program like this one. You know, you don't have to define a derivative for them unless it's a new kind of derivative, right? You don't have to do that. Um, sometimes you can just say, here's a word and here's a reference if you, if you want to look it up. I mean, for derivative, you wouldn't even use a reference. But if I said something like, oh, I don't know what's a good example. If I said something like, I don't know, uh, co-dimension two bifurcation. Okay, so co-dimension, that one is not even clear if I would even put a citation, but I'd, I'd probably put a citation to a textbook in case somebody wants to review those styles of, com of, of, of co-dimension two. Or if it was a specific type of co-dimension two, but it's in an elementary graduate textbook, maybe I would just cite the textbook and just give a terse definition, but not go into the details of explaining the definition. So it, it, it will also depend on what you're emphasizing. If it's something that you're just telling people, oh, by the way, here's this, then you shouldn't go into too much detail. You should give them a reference and they can look it up. But if it's a concept that's important for what you're doing, especially since you'll get some readers who are not already doing it, then you should go in a little bit more detail. So there's some judgment involved, but um, so maybe for Siam Applied Dynamical Systems, you know, somebody who, you know, a general audience would be somebody who gets a PhD, you know, in Applied Dynamical Systems, in Dynamical Systems, but even then there's some breadth because somebody could get it in what are called hyperbolic systems and somebody could get it in Hamiltonian systems, somebody could get it in ergodic theory. You know, so, so anyway, so I hope that gives some idea. Um, it's a judgment call, different people have different styles. I put more introductory stuff than others because I want potentially my paper to be of interest to people who are not yet working on it 
and might later. So at least to get some idea of you know why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, if I write in a different journal, it will be different, right? So if I write for physical review E, because um, and they have different subsections, right? If you write for a journal subsection, you might be able to to do demands a little bit that are in that subsection, but not in other parts of the journal. I think the SIAM journals don't explicitly divide into subsections, but PRE will have a section for, for networks and complex systems, and it will have a section for, I don't know, non-equilibrium physics or whatnot. So, you know, if I, if I write for PRE, I will assume some basic background in statistical mechanics, because it's a journal that's related to StatMech and various things that are related to it. If I write for SIAM, um, for, for SIAM Journal of Applied Dynamical Systems, there might be some basic concepts from STATMEC that I might want to define that I would not bother defining if I put the paper in PRE because, because the audience is somewhat different. Um, okay, so there's been some evolution in how I do things because the network stuff is, I don't know if it was ever really niche, but it's a lot more common than it is now. It's actually a top level physics classification. Um, when I was writing earlier stuff on networks, and you'll see this in other people's, people's papers as well, I would have a larger background on what a network is you know, than, than I do now. But now enough people study it that certain things that I felt were necessary 10 years ago, I, I no longer feel are necessary because things change and things become more standard. Um, a good example of a topic now where I'm still struggling um, about this are things like topological data analysis. Because one of the things that's tricky there is that we're putting this in applied math and in physics journals, but you know, even the introductory concepts from algebraic topology are not ones that most audience members from that journal have had, but you don't want to write a 10 million page introduction every single paper, right? So you've got something where the core audience has not usually had that material, but you can't just write you know, essays about it every paper. So it's currently undergoing a transition, so I, I'm you know, anticipating that how terse I will be about certain basic concepts in that topic, that I'll gradually get terser as it goes along as more people know about it. Um, and this depends on the topic you're studying. Okay, let's see what else. Um, okay, so this is different for different papers. This was definitely different for different uh, ones of my PhD students when I was doing this a couple weeks ago. Um, this will be different ones for you as well, and I know that also other people have different opinions on it. Another test that I've heard people give, one of my, one of my physics collaborators mentioned it this way, when I was, uh, for a review article, pinging her about whether certain things should be defined, she's like, okay, there's the Google test. If I don't know the definition and I Google the word, how easily can I find it? Which, which is, you know, I mean, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's a reasonable way of phrasing it. Okay. It may well be, yeah. But, but you know, at least the co-authored pa co papers, that's the best I can do, right? No, but the idea was, here's a word that maybe, you know, different authors have different backgrounds, yeah. right? And so maybe it's, it's obvious for her, because she has a different background, she's a physicist, and has taken courses that I never took, it's not obvious for me. So then, okay, I do the Google search, because we can't define all of it. I do the Google search. If I find a definition that's clear, relatively easy, you know, relatively easily, which could just be a review article, or could even be Wikipedia pointing to a review article, then it's like, okay, if somebody's confused, they can do this and repeat this. Whereas if I do a Google search and spend lots and lots of time and like, you know, I'm sorry, I still cannot find a clear statement of what it is, it's an indication that maybe we should at least intuitively say in one sentence, here's what it is, here's a place to look it up. You had your hand up, I thought? Or? Oh, you can use incognito, right? What is incognito? The incognito mode of Google that doesn't Oh, you mean you mean you mean the one? Uh, I should be. Yeah. That's the best you have. Yeah. Well, we should be. You know, your your data is safe in public. He says uh, on a, on something that's going to go up on YouTube. Um, okay. So let's scroll through the paper. I don't know if you want me to literally scroll through the paper or if I just I can. The 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 writing on a couple of these slides is going to get small, so we can decide later on if we want to literally scroll through the paper or do that, but. Um, but let's just go through the basic idea. So this is the paper, it's PRE. It has a very long introduction, as I said, longer than usual. It has a section called background, which has a short paragraph and then three subsections. It has a method section, despite the fact I said try not to do that. Um, so, so somehow we, we did that anyway, um, which has a short paragraph and then a couple different things in methods. 
Um, it's got numerical simulations and results, and I kind of told you not to do that one either, um, but you never know. Um, so we have a few paragraphs, and then <laughs> we actually have quite a few subsections. One of the reasons this paper has a lot is that different subsections essentially was family of networks one. Okay, basic thing we're doing, we do it on family of networks one, we do it on family of networks two, and so on. Had our conclusions, which was longer than usual. This paper was maybe 23, 24 pages, so this is actually close to three times longer than a normal PRE paper. The editors yell at me. We have acknowledgments. I prefer the E spelling. That actually doesn't matter, but anyway. Um, we have an appendix, and this appendix was one that actually the referees, and it was a good comment from them, asked us to do, and, and it's a nice example to bring up because it's related to some of the things um, that we were discussing. They, we were doing some regression, and uh, you know, as, you know, regression is standard, but if you have a physics training and you're writing in physics journal, it may not be standard for them, and one of the referees said, you know, it would be helpful if you had a section that illustrated the type of regression that you were doing, but you know, then if you put it in that section, then anyone who wants it in this appendix can read it, and anyone who doesn't need it can ignore it. And, and so this was actually, some of the stuff was already in the paper, but a referee, it was, it was a good comment. The referee asked us to kind of put this in as a section. And, and to just illustrate it, because the results that we were showing essentially are often the results of that. And it ends up being an introduction that's a lot, you know, has a lot fewer pages than if you were doing an introduction in a book and so on. Um, Appendix B, you know, you thought we had a lot of examples in the main text, and then we have four more families of networks. Um, the reason that there are more that are here is that some of these are not quite the same as the network family. So an example might, um, i trying to remember if these came out the same, but there's a ring lattice and then a ring lattice with like one shortcut, and the question is whether one shortcut does something or not, or it doesn't. So the idea is that qualitatively, these are all somehow similar to ones that we already discussed in the main text, so there didn't seem to be much of a point there, but the fact that it gives you some qualitatively similar results, we felt, but some quantitatively different ones, we felt to put it in there. Arguably, you could just have a sentence that says, if I do this example, it gives me results that are similar to this other example. So, so in a sense, this could be optional, and it's a choice that we made, but because it's an appendix, we also made it easy for people to skip it if they don't want it. Um, okay, but, but I can imagine not including this being a common variant that somebody else might have chosen. Um, appendix C is literally one paragraph and just has a bunch of tables with numbers uh, for each of the examples where putting this in the main text would make it really distracting and the qualitative things are more important than the numbers but we wanted to just you know include precise statements of what we did and so who knows who will ever read this but you know the, re the reading that we did of this during page proofs may be like the most time that's ever spent on this appendix in the history of this paper I don't know um, but that's what this actually is. It's a bunch of tables and a short paragraph saying the types of things that are in them. And then, of course, references. Okay. Uh, let's see what else I want to say. So I tend to be more thorough in introductions. I actually think overall that's a good thing because then other people who are not yet working on that problem can read the introduction and get ideas of where to look and so on. But it's definitely longer than the norm in terms of what the rules are, in terms of what some of these books will say. Um, we were even more extreme here. Um, but what I want to answer with an introduction is, you know, why am I writing the paper? Where does it fit in the literature? Um, I don't know if we literally want to scroll through it. Here's my really tiny writing. It's one reason why I thought we could literally scroll. So this is my introduction. It has 11 paragraphs. Most introductions that you will write will be shorter. Most introductions that I write will be shorter. As I said, this one's actually on the extreme of my own distribution, and since I tend to be on the extreme, that means it's rather extreme. This writing is so small, I can't even read it. Um, what I want to emphasize with it, though, um, is the sort of hierarchical storytelling part. So, so the first part was introduction to social interactions, opinion dynamics, etc. So, so why do we care about the general problem of opinion dynamics? Um, the second one is, okay, there are various methods um, for how to study it, and you can connect them to different things like in statistical physics, and we cited some work on some other models, some variant models, okay? So, so try, trying to say, where is it? Now we have this long paragraph. I don't think we wanted to make it long, but there was not really a good way to split it. Um, a particular type of model that we study in this paper is known as bounded confidence models. 
these actually have continuous distributions. Um, and then we eventually, towards the end of that problem, uh, end of that paragraph, get to the specific example of a bounded confidence model, at least approximately, that that we study and types of questions that people have done on that one, right? So we've gone from social dynamics, opinions, particular family of models of opinions, particular example within that family of models, right? I mean, um, then there's some more work people have done on those models, including some various analytical work and extensions. So these paragraphs, this five through eight, I think for a lot of paragraphs, for a lot of papers might actually end up being one paragraph because they're all kind of getting to prior work but different parts of prior work, okay? So this is the one where, you know, maybe we could have done, shown less or whatnot. Okay, paragraph nine, big picture, here's what we do. Okay, so as I said, usually in introductions, this would be a little bit earlier, but we went extreme here, but we still, it's still, this, this introduction, though really long, still has the basic hierarchical structure, just in verbose format, you know, kind of a, a microcosm of my existence. Um, anyway, paragraph 10, which is related to paragraph nine. Paragraph nine is big picture, here's what we did. Paragraph 10, which happened to be a bit long, um, we're trying to say specific, more specifically what we did to try to get at the idea in nine. Okay, so nine might be saying, I am studying, I don't know, I'm studying whether I have consensus, I'm studying how many opinion groups I have at steady state, and so on. Ten might be, in order to do this, I do this on these particular families of networks, and I do regression models. Do, do, do you see what, I say, what I'm saying? It's trying to get more into how did we, in particular, try to get at the big picture thing in nine. And then paragraph 11 is one of these types of things that, well, in a PRL you wouldn't bother because you because you need space. But um, and some people don't like these. I actually do like these because I find that they're helpful when I'm when I read. This is the rest of this paper is organized as follows: in section two I do blah, in section three I do blah. Um, I mean, assuming it's a, a journal which allows you to number sections. Um, so some people don't like these um, because, in a sense, it's redundant and all the information is elsewhere. Um, if you have hyperlinks on the sections, it's great. Not all PDFs are giving you hyperlinks on the, on the left side. Um, but anyway, so, so this is one where people might not have. Okay, so this is a long one, but the structure, even in verbose form, is there. It's probably not my best introduction. I think it's a reasonably good one. I think it does what it should do. Um, okay, so what goes into a conclusions or conclusions and discussion, usually in that order, actually. Um, so the most canonical type would go roughly in the following order. Different amounts would be present in different things. So first, a, big, a little bit of big picture about the problem you studied in the context of what you're trying to look at. The idea is the abstract's already been written. The abstract was, you know, we're taking the reader on a journey. We're now doing an outro rather than an intro. Outro is, I think it may officially be a word now. This will be a less painful outro than the one in, um, um, in Freebird, which is a very painful outro, if you've ever tried it on Guitar Hero or something. But anyway, um, you know, now we're terser than we were in the introduction. We were terser than we were before because it's, we're, we're saying it for, for the second time. Um, but the idea is, you know, here's kind of what we tried to do. And now that you've kind of seen where we've gone, you know, you may know where we are. Um, then there will be some specific results, not necessarily all of them, especially if you have a lot, in summary form. Okay, so, so the first one might say, oh, you know, we did, you know, we looked at bounded confidence models to try to find blah, blah, blah. So this is analogous to um, like paragraphs 9 and 10 from the introduction in a sense. So this first sentence is kind of like paragraph 9 from the introduction, because it's the big picture part, and, and 10, although with the knowledge of now having done it, it's kind of like, well, here's what we in particular did. Um, the third paragraph, and again, not all these will be there in full form in every, in every conclusion. You know, what did we learn, especially in the big picture context, from the specific things we did, right? Now that we've, the state of the world has changed, now that we've done this, there's surely stuff that we now understand that we didn't understand before we started. Hopefully also stuff that the reader now understands that they didn't understand before they started. And so we want to give some idea of what we've learned from the results. Um, 
Sometimes this one might be really short, by the way, um, or even non-existent. And then some idea of future work. Um, and in particular, not just random other things you can do, right? You know, you can always say things like, oh, we studied co-dimension one bifurcations, now we're gonna study co-dimension two bifurcations, it's future work. I mean, that can be true, but that's, that starts to have a throwaway feel, right? What you really wanna say is, from these lessons that we've learned, here are things that we now think we should do in the future, and the lessons could well just be things that were more complicated in what we wanted to do than, what we, thought, than, the, than we thought they would be. Right? But the idea is that given what we've done, here is future work that at least we think ar arises from these efforts from what we've learned. It could have been something that you might have thought of anyway, but we happen not to think of it, or it could directly follow. Okay? But somehow you're connecting it to your paper. This, by the way, this and the abstract, by the way, is, is where is one of the places where, where, where people might be most inclined towards sliding into the hole of BS, right? Because they say, you know, now that we this, we've learned blah, 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 or, or, or blah, 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 universality, blah, 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 right? right? You know, I mean, it's, you have to, you want to somehow convey what you've done is important, because presumably you actually think there's something important, whether it's technical or more big picture, but you need to do it in a, an appropriately cautious way and an and honest way. Um, and then there'll be some relevant discussions of limitations. This sometimes doesn't occur here. Sometimes it actually occurs um, you know, in the context of different sections because it might be more appropriate there. So this will be somewhere in your paper, but will not necessarily be here. But you, know, you need to make sure that this comes across, right? You didn't solve the theory of everything, unless, of course, you actually did solve the theory, <laughs> theory of everything. Um, but, but the idea is that, you know, if you found something was universal, you probably found it actually under certain assumptions. And when people read your paper, you don't want them to get across, oh, here's everything. You, you know, you also want them to get across, you also want to get across what the hypotheses are. This is also where the danger for BS comes in, where somebody might have said, you know, un, you know they might have shown under certain assumptions that something is generic or universal or whatever it is, and then suddenly you look in the abstract or you look in, um, in nature and, and so on, and it's they solved everything and somehow the assumption has been somehow swept under the rug. You, I mean, I, I'm trying to be more concrete from what you were asking about earlier, but like there's certain ways that, that and, and, and people won't even necessarily do it on purpose, but it's just, anyway. So limitations are important, assumptions are important, they're often elsewhere in the paper, but sometimes they show up here too. Okay, I've already, I'm not gonna go through it because it's already now five, we have some more time, but you know, you, you know, the stuff is available online, you can all just look at it, you can ask me later and, and whatnot. Okay, I kind of addressed this earlier, but I think it's worth bringing this up again. This is where being an applied mathematician comes in. I just went through a paper that was in a physics journal and I advertised this as writing you know, paper writing in applied mathematics. Well, I write papers in physics journals sometimes because I'm an applied mathematician. And I also write papers in applied math journals and in biology journals and in fancy journals and so on. Um, I think the only main thing I did in this paper that might have been different from an applied math journal is that I assumed a bit more statistical physics because I put it in PRE than I would have in an applied math journal. And I suspect that in an applied math journal, I would not have been asked by, an, by, by a referee to put in that appendix about introduction to statistical inference for what we did. Uh, in a stats journal, they would have been like, why the hell are you doing this? This is undergraduate material, you know, and people have to take this as a course, as part of a course. Anyway, um, okay, anyway, so we need to be able to write multiple parts of papers. Ugh. Now the writing's even smaller, and we're not going to go through everything, but I'll give you some idea. Uh, you have to make fun of yourself, too. It's important. Okay, this one is in SIAM, um, Journal of Applied Dynamical Systems. The reason I picked, and this paper also, I did a couple things that I don't normally do. Um, the reason I picked it is because I was in the process of actually refereeing a paper for SIADS, and I had recently read um, some of their instructions to referees, which is something I'm going to want to share with you. And some of these things, you know, most of these things are actually available on websites. And so when you submit to a journal, and even before you finish writing the paper, you're going to want to read what they expect of you. Um, 
And so, so there's some of that that I want to, that I want to go through. Um, I'm not going to go through this paper in the same detail, or the meta part of this paper in the same detail as, as before. But, okay, so for those of you who are out there in the Twitterverse or elsewhere, um, we skipped a couple slides. Stuff happened. Imagine it like in the movie Spaceballs when it goes black. Who knows what's happening at that point? Um, in any event, you can read stuff yourself. And if you know me, you can contact me. If you don't know me, well, we can you know, use your judgment. OK, so how could you repeat your question? Because I want to get back to that. Yeah, so I, I'm asking, um, suppose you have a, a, a result, uh, you do some experiments, so you report some results, you report some uh, uh, graphics. And I think what I will, what I, what I will t t uh, typically do is that I will describe what happens, what, what happens on, on, on the plots, and what happens in these numbers. Right. This number is higher than that number. Right. And we have a first level implications of okay, this higher, this is higher than that. Right. Plot, Right. We, this is this is factual. Right. So that causes sort of low level description. Okay. Then after this, we can have a something high level. So what what we be opinion based. It could be opinion based, or or what you think we learn from the fact that the first number is higher than the second number. It's getting closer to the bullshit part. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. You have to be careful. Yeah. Right, right, right. So you have to see, you, you know you have to say what you what you feel you learn. Yeah. Now I, I guess where the where the BS part come where you should not do the BS part is. You should say what you, you know, it has to be what you actually think. Yes. Right? Like, okay, so, so this is a very good question because I think we, uh, we face this with just about every paper, right? Um, so some of the low-level results, I, I, know I, I always have trouble with that term, but some of the just purely factual results, number A is larger than number B, may already be presented in the caption, in the discussion, and so on. And in fact... Um, okay, I don't, this was on a much earlier slide, but when I was talking about what should be in a conclusion where brief big picture and then some of the facts, you won't do all the facts because that's what the paper's for, but you may well be, oh, we found that blah blah situation tends to give larger numbers than blah blah situation. Right? So now this is a summary of many figures, and you use tends to because, well, it was often true, but it wasn't usually true. Or you say, we found using our computations on this system, because maybe it's important the type of system you used for those results, that blah, blah, blah. And then it'll be, oh, this implies that blah. Okay, so this is tricky, because, of course, what you believe it implies may be different from others. Um, I would be careful about how strong the words are, because, in fact, so, you know, you, you can't really say this means that blah because you're sort of saying there's no, accept, no, no exception, right? You know, or this shows that blah, again, you're sort of making this very concrete thing that doesn't allow exceptions. So you could say this suggests that blah, and you might also, if you're worried about whether you're stating too much, give a caveat along with it, right? Or this suggests that blah, at least in the context of our examples in which whatever. However, we believe that this result will be more, you know, so, so in this Meng et al. paper, for instance, actually I should say in this Meng et al. paper, not completely screw up my student's pronunciation. Um, sorry, I had several people in the room cringing because unlike me, you actually know how to pronounce it. Um, um, Anyway, uh, I always have to remind myself that how it's spelled in English is not a perfect mapping to how it should be pronounced, so I make mistakes sometimes. Anyway, what we did there is that we had, you know, certain things that, you know, we saw, we saw numerically that they were true for certain examples. We believe that some of the observations were probably true for other examples, but we didn't do those. So the idea is that, you know, we observed in our numerical computations that whatever. Um, and, and then we believe that this will also be true. In that case, it really is believed because we didn't try it. But sometimes it's like, okay, this suggests that because so-and-so feature resembles another feature. So it's not the same as proving a theorem that says, given this feature, I'm guaranteed that something occurs, but the hope is that there's some similarity. You know, so suggest is a weaker word than implies, right? There's, there's a whole hierarchy of how weak or strong it is. Um, you know, um, so it's... It's a fine line, and, but the weakness of the word is important, right? You know, and, and you want to say why it suggests it. You know, because um, these other networks have similar structures you know, to this one, we also believe that this will probably be true, you know, you know right? So, so somehow a belief that something, you know, okay. But 
tends to is nice because this allows it to not always be true. Pinning it down to the examples that you studied, that's always good because, well, those are the ones you actually checked. So in terms of how you organize these, um, these, these, these payments, do you sort of, how do you, well, so in my mind there are probably two ways is that you, you put all these up, even those opinion based, you know, these, um, these, these what do we believe and what, we, what, what it suggests in the, in the, together with experiments. So right, right. Or you have a separate section like discussion. Um, uh, so sometimes what you will do is that you will have some of these mentioned right when you do the experiment or do the numerical experiment because you've already set up all the language and so on whereas maybe only a subset of them will show up in the discussion because you know you do an experiment in one setting you see a certain trend you do an experiment in another setting maybe you see the same trend now you start having a belief that maybe it's more common what's common among the trends you try to break it and so on um, but there's also there's not just opinion versus fact there's also something shows it's true, right? Maybe it shows rigorously. Or based on this heuristic calculation, it, Im you know, it implies that blah, well, it's heuristic calculation, so it implies maybe slightly strong, but you know, this, su this, this further suggests that whatever. But the word suggests is weaker than implies. Um, I mean, another one that people will use, blah, blah, may be useful for whatever. They, they almost never write, but it may not. The, the blah blah may be useful for some, and it's not that I never do that, but one should be really careful, right? Because it, suddenly you start getting into the realm of speculation depending on what, okay, if you say that it, your method may be useful for studying bifurcations in other systems, you're probably safe. If you say that this may be useful for solving cancer, then I'm like, but it may not. I mean, it's, yeah. You had a question too, Shay, right? Or was this related, oh, yeah, yeah. related was, to that? I was thinking it's worth noting that in this paper you actually don't have the results section. Right. So we don't have a results section. Um, the results, essentially, we have results sections that are, that are specific ones. So for example, one results section is that we use a methodology to actually construct approximate periodic orbits. So in a sense, the ability to do the construction is a result, because that was one of the things we wanted to do. We just don't have a section called results. Um, this is more, actually, this is kind of a, con a discussion section because we're trying to say what's relevant about these things to an ecological application. Um, okay, but yeah, we don't have it. Um, so the, these parts are the toughest parts, right? And the thing is, you may have different co-authors on a paper who don't agree, who have different styles, right? I mean, this, it's tricky. And the different words have different strengths. So the, you know, the, you know, the, somehow the simplest situation is the purely mathematical one where here's my theorem. It's a theorem. That's it. If I didn't make a mistake, it's just true. That's right. You don't have the same problem where somehow you want to, you know, I do something and ideally it also teaches me about something that's not quite the same thing I did, but I'm not 100% guaranteed. How confident am I about it? Right? You don't want to just say that it is true because clearly you can't justify that, but, but you have something that's knowledge based that somehow supports it. Maybe the example is similar, so hopefully everything doesn't completely fall apart. Maybe you said, based on numerical, you know, we showed it analytically in this other one. It has a similar structure. Our numerical calculations, you know, suggest that it, you know, is likely also true here. You know, there's also qualifying words like likely and so on. But if you start saying is, that's kind of demanding certain things. If you start saying maybe, which has become code for is almost, it's almost like the sociological part has made the term worse than the literal meaning would be. Okay, um, another thing I wanted to bring up with this particular paper, with the, with the, with the one with Sophia Piltz, um, we did actually include supplementary materials, and some of the stuff, and I think Appendix B is the one there, we didn't write the formulas in Appendix B because the formulas are long and don't teach you anything, and what's really important is the fact that we can get them. And this is where the Mathematica notebooks come in because then, or solutions in common separated variables. If somebody really wants to duplicate the work, they really do need this long formula that's completely uninstructive to show. And so the nice thing about these notebooks is if somebody needs it, it's there. So, so that was, and, and, and then, you know, if somebody, um, you know, especially if somebody wants to check something, because we want it to be complete, 
it was nice to do this as a supplement. This is an online only journal, so we didn't have to do a supplement. It's just that, you know, it's like this huge long formula that, you know, you can't even learn anything from what the terms look like in this particular case. In some cases you can. Here's a Mathematica notebook. So nowadays, really, I mean, okay, if I were, if I were, if I were hip, this would have been Jupyter notebook. I assume Jupyter existed when we were doing this. But, um, you know, a Jupyter notebook is actually a fine thing to do as a supplementary material for certain things because then that will help people learn stuff. Okay, so, so the reason I chose that journal, amazingly, I get a screenshot from a text file and the font size becomes bigger, <laughs> which is, should never happen. It tells you I, 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 had, I, I, I sinned a bit in, 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 in how much text I put on there, but I wanted to put all that stuff on the slide. Um, so I chose that paper partly because it was an applied math journal rather than a physics journal and I wanted to, to bring up at least one other example and then I also um, chose this specific applied math journal because I had some instructions that I wanted to share um, and, and a lot of these will show up online okay so you'll notice that I started from two one is you know you, you must actually think as a referee that the paper is you know scientifically correct you don't check everything but of course, we're, you know, there's some notion of scientific correctness. Yeah, you, you look like you have a question. So, did you add or did it actually say the manuscript must not be painful to read? This is a direct quote. That, that does sound like something I would write, doesn't it? <laughs> no, this is a direct screenshot. I did not change a single word in there. Is painful to read like code name for like something else? I mean, okay, so not necessarily, but let me. Is being recorded. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I'm going to try to say this in a way that's not horrible. Um, but, but first of all, so instruction one had to do with correctness. Of course, you don't actually literally duplicate somebody else's calculation because then no one would ever referee a paper because that's essentially impossible. Unless it's like this, really, you know, of course, if you're talking about like the Navia Stokes, you know, you know, famous problem, yes, you actually want someone to check that. But realistically, you do the best you can. Okay, so not painful to read. So it's not, co it's not actually code because in fact, I know a lot of people and I, um, who, where, where you know, English is their first language, where they try to write something, it's completely not clear. But it's also true, and I know this you know, because it's challenging. It is challenging. I couldn't write something in another language, right? So it's not like, you know, this is not unique to anybody. It's just that English is the language that won out in this respect. And, you know, therefore, I'm playing the game on an easier level. That, that, that is what it is, right? So it does happen that you get submissions from people where it's clear that their English command is not that great, and they may not have a co-author who can, who can help them out with it because, I don't know, they're on the faculty of a, somewhere else that's not, in, you know, they may do their teaching in another language because they're in the faculty of elsewhere, and only when they write papers do they deal with English. So it stands to reason that they would have more problems. Now, this becomes very difficult because, you know, you don't want to punish people for that. You want to do something about it. But if you can't evaluate the paper, it's hard to separate things. Okay, but painful to read is not actually code for that because I know from experience there's plenty of people who are born, raised in English-speaking countries and they try to write something that's totally unclear. Probably Siam maybe should have written this in a slightly different way because it's getting too close to my style, but no, I did not actually change this text. Um, it is a fair criterion for a paper. If it's painful to read, the authors need to do more work and you probably should return it to them. I wouldn't even do it as a sort of rejection. I would say, look, we know you may need to find someone to help you, but please find someone to help you make this easier to read so we can evaluate the paper. Otherwise, we don't feel we can go further. I think that's, I think that's reasonable. Um, okay, so the organization can be confused. The English can be poor. Okay, many minor mistakes is, I wouldn't put that as equivalent to the other. It, they can add up, but it's not the same. Um, I favor more the rewritten rather than rejection because you should give people a chance to correct it if you think there's a chance that there might be science that's there. The, the idea though is that this is making it impossible to evaluate the science because there's so much other stuff before you can even get to that point. That, that's really where this is going. 
You know, there's going to be some diff. It's it's not just that somebody messed up the grammar slightly because English is not their first language, but you basically understand what they did. It's I cannot even figure out what's going on. Um, okay, introduction, conclusion. I mean, this is stuff I've said. Um, and then this will differ in different journals, right? So it's not just that it's new and correct, but there must be, you know, why the hell did you write the paper in the first place? Some answer to that. Um, this first sentence for plus one, I mean, that's what they say. It has to be new and correct. Sorry, they don't, well, they say some new. Plus one doesn't require anything about groundbreaking. So they're, 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 in a, they're, they're living in a different ecosystem in terms of what they decide to do. Um, okay, sorry, go ahead, you had a question. Yeah, so this is kind of vague, although I can try and come up with examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I tried to, I, I occasionally was vague in my answers to some of your questions because it was hard to be concrete, so it's so fine. How, so I could write a paper that's very clear and precise and super boring. Oh, you could. Right? I could write a paper that's like really interesting to read, <laughs> but harder to follow, and like, but with more personality, right? You could. So how do you sort of toe the line? So, so how, in, in, in a sentence, how literary should your paper be? Right. So I think different people will give different answers. That's a pretty well-phrased question, actually. No, not vague. I don't think it's vague. But um, how uh, different people will give different answers. Um, one difference between, say, science and, and literature, and even, even scholarship in the humanities, I mean, I've, I've had humanities, I mean, this, I had these discussions more at Oxford because I had more access to these people, but they really talk, I mean, they describe writing being beautiful and so on. They're, you know, they're, they're optimizing something that's a bit different than what we are. Um, whereas we're trying to optimize clarity, so, so clarity is number one. At the same time, it would be good to not be completely boring but don't sacrifice clarity, you know, don't sacrifice clarity for the purpose of making it more interesting. So here's, here's like a specific example. Okay. Right, so in a paper that I'm working on, <laughs> right now, I have two figures. One where arrows are very disorderly and like firm around and open sizes and stuff. One where they're more or less orderly, right? Yeah, sure. And I describe the first figure with, as the arrows being higgledy piggledy. And I describe the second set of arrows as orderly. Okay. And now, like higgledy piggledy does mean disordered without okay. anything. So, okay. Okay, so, all right, let me, let me answer that. Okay, so you could get away with it, but the issue that I actually have, there's a couple different, so I would be picking, I'm picking on the language, and I actually would be picking on the language at this point. So, so higgledy-piggledy, the, while the, the word kind of, you know, sounds like what it means, in a sense, I forgot there's a word for that too, but um, I would actually not be in favor of it, not because it's informal, I actually don't mind the fact that it's informal, but, this is the type of word that people who are not native English speakers are going to have trouble figuring out what you mean. And I think that's an issue. But the informal part, which is more at the essence of the question that you were asking, maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, but this one I think has a more fundamental issue that prevents it. Okay. Orderly, I potentially have issues with for, for a different reason, but it depends on what else is in your paper, namely because words like order have been sort of hijacked as jargon in other parts of mathematics, and the question is whether you need, it, whether you need orderly in those contexts for what you're working on or for in fields that are similar to what you're working on. So my intuition on it, just because, but it's partly because you know, I come from dynamical systems, and so if you say orderly, I'm like, mm, do I want to use that word for in that? In some sense, this is a point in favor of higgledy-piggledy, right? Because this is a word that is never used no, in no. medical context. Well, sure, sure. No, but, but, but my objection had, yeah. but my, my fundamental objection was, what, the thing with jargon or with informal words, I mean, sometimes you can do it, right? It's not that you should never do it. I don't, I don't like the hard and fast you should never do it, because sometimes that really conveys the right thing. Um, this one I just, I don't like because I feel like enough people would not know what you're talking about and especially people who don't have English as a first language, as my, and my thought. I have not tested it out, right? I have not tested this out. I agree with that because I don't know what it means. Right. There's, I mean, you know, so I, I had a paper where, and I don't remember what the final version did, but I had something that we described a set of eigenvalues as a loxodromic quartet. Actually, that is correct both in terms of English and in terms of mathematics. It's referring to like a diamond of eigenvalues, so the symmetry is giving you a diamond. And, and, and that is actually a correct name for it. Loxodrome comes from, comes from something that ends up meaning this sort of thing. And, and the referee complained mildly. I mean, this would be a small complaint, right? This would not be a big complaint because if you're rejecting a paper for this reason, 
I think I think you need to be a little bit, you know, you know, take the Forgive stick you. out of your butt, basically, if you're rejecting for that. You can complain about it, but you wouldn't reject a paper for this reason alone. At least not if it only occurred once. Maybe if it occurred every, you know, sentence or something. But um, in any event, you know, so so they complained because they felt not enough people would know what it, mean, it meant. I was somewhat annoyed because, in fact, it also had the correct technical meaning and it was in the dictionary and so on. But I'm like, okay, fine. I'll just call it a quartet and remove the adjective. And even though that has extra extra meaning, you know. So, you know, have you talked to your co-author about this one? So, so I have two co-authors. <laughs> so one of them likes it quite a bit. One of them does not like it as much. Right, and we're going to not mention their names because right. we are being recorded. I have a guess as to which is which. It'll be interesting <laughs> if I'm right. Anyway, you're we're probably right. Okay, <laughs> but we're we're going to we're going to not do that in, in on the it's being recorded. Um, okay, so the this one was instructions to referees. It's probably on the website, but it's the type of thing that ought to be public in terms of. You know, you should know how your paper is going to be evaluated, and the fact that language is considered important, as it should be, and it's worth knowing that referees are being told that language is considered very important, and language is very important. And then you know, the fact is, people who are PhD students in mathematics and postdocs in mathematics are trained in mathematics and related fields, and are not necessarily trained in how to write about it, and it's a skill in and of itself. Um, okay. So this is online. I mean, this was also given to the referees, but this is online and is an editorial policy. And, and when you're submitting to a journal, and especially when you're starting, you've decided what journal, or at least preliminarily decided what journal you think you, you want your paper in, you should look this up because it will, it will affect decisions you make and how you write it in terms of which sections you have and so on. Um, so it publishes you know, s various stuff. Um, submitted articles should either contribute to the theory or to the phenomenon or experiment or numerics or be used in applications. Um, okay, now this is broader than some other journals might be, right? They're particularly broad. Some dynamical systems journals de facto are theorem proof. Usually if you look at the editorial policy or similar documents, you also look at previous papers that have been published, but really the official policy tends to be the the one that gives these hints. Um, and articles must contain, so as it does say they have to be written clearly, although they, they got less um, pointed than they did in that other, in that other text. Um, must contain substantially new results and relate them to existing literature. Um, well, this may be relevant for some of you because some of you do conference proceedings. There's a whole thing about when can the expanded version of a conference proceeding also be submitted to a journal Right, that, that, that becomes, for computer scientists and people who interact with computer scientists, that becomes a very big thing. Um, okay. Um, right. Okay, so you should look at editorial policies. Yes? So, taking sort of another example from this paper I'm working on. So, I have a, a proof in it, and the proof really, it's... So the, the proof is proving a question no one's ever asked before. Sure. Right? And like, after you, so it, it seems like a very odd question, and it seems odd the result happens, but once you do a little bit of explaining, it's very clear why it sort of should work, and then there's like three pages of, of tracing through the actual calculations. Right. So, right. so that seems reasonable because, you know, you, you people only want to slog through, like a, so only a subset will want to slog through the three pages, whereas a lot more might be interested, here's why it makes sense. Yes, right. So, so that, that's at the core of my question, right? So is there a place for, and then what is the place for, provided it exists? The slog part? Well, the, the former part, actually, right? The, the former part, part where you explain why one should think this okay. would work. So, I think this depends a bit on different papers because, in fact, I think the former part for most readers will be more, I'm sorry, the informal part for most readers will be more important than the technical yeah, details. Yeah, sure. um, what some pure mathematicians will do in papers, the ones, you know, ones who I think are very good writers, they will have a section, they will have one subsection that gives this idea, but that, but that only defines the things they need to present it, so they define minimal things, or they might even have, you know, they might even say introduction, basic definitions, just so that there's some meaning to certain words, and then they might have a section that's your section, and then the rest of it, which instead of being three pages, might actually be like 50, will slog. Right, so it's like saying sketch a proof. 
sketch of argument. Yeah. Um, so, so that is one time, sometimes it will be done like just in a separate section, coordinate off. Other times what you might do if it's all in one section is that you might have a section that you then, in the first subsection you do the simpler stuff, or simpler is not the right word, but informal summary, and then, and then you start in the next parts of the, su of, of the subsection, do the more informal stuff. Yeah, Baitran, you have a question? Uh -huh. Oh, you're stretching. I guess I, I kind of know how I can proceed technically in terms of structuring the document. Right, work. right. But, I mean, when I'm reading, so I have two minds about this, right? One mind says, Michael, be as clear as possible, theorem proof, theorem proof, theorem proof, theorem proof, right? Just be sort of very precise. Right, that's right? not always as clear but, as possible, not other, for every paper. That's, that's fair. But the other part of me says, Michael, when you read a paper, you never, ever slog through the part. You just read no, the No, no, and you only slog through it if you might use the techniques. Exactly, yeah, right. So there's kind of like, in I, my mind, there's... I think putting it in either separate sections or separate subsections, the reason, one reason I like that is that the subsectioning allows people to skip stuff they don't want. Mm -hmm. If somebody already knows the sort of intuition and doesn't want to waste their time, or you know, only likes theorem proof and goes right to it, they go to it. But if if somebody just wants an idea of what, you, so so you're trying to essentially you're trying to you're trying to you know do things that are good for two different audiences, yeah. and essentially so. Different sections, different subsections, having both. You know, when you introduce the one that's the, um, the, the informal one, you say, okay, look, we're gonna present these ideas to see why it makes sense. In section blah, 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 we will do this rigorously, but for now we will proceed like this, just to give the idea. But it's definitely okay to do the Yeah, it's absolutely okay. It's absolutely okay. I, um, I think that, you know, you don't wanna make it harder for people to read, but you also wanna recognize that some people can skip the section, you know. In some cases, although it sounds like not in yours given what you've described, the slogging part might even be relegated to an appendix, but it sounds like from yours it's more important than that it should actually be in the main section. I mean, at least that's the impression I get. Yeah, okay. Your question was, ah, it works with the title. We'll see if it works with the contents of the slide. Be clear, explicit, and precise. Okay, so, I wasn't even referring to things like theorem proof. I was more like, when you do pointers, I tend to not like see the figure above. I mean, if it's literally immediately above, that might be okay. But often above might include multiple things that are above. So I prefer to, I prefer to be like, see figure 10, see table, whatever, see algorithm, whatever, see equation, whatever. Um, so I do this a little bit more than others. And it, it's going to be, I mean, again, there are always exceptions. Um, Usually locations, when you do pointers like this, will be a lot less self-evident to the people who are reading the paper than to the people who are writing the paper. So I prefer to err on the side of, you know, backslash ref and backslash label and so on. Um, be clear and explicit and precise about descriptions, assumptions, and so on, right? You don't just say, my method is better than their method, although many papers do say that. You say, Studying these data sets, using this way of evaluating it, we found that this particular method gave a higher whatever, as kind of with the evaluation, than the other method. It's not just that therefore A is better than B. Well, if, that, if everything else is perfectly chosen for this problem, okay, but chances are you have to make some choices. Um, okay, and then yeah, don't leave it. Don't leave them th things to guess. And of course, we're human. We may forget to say something despite our best intentions. And that's where things like public code can be really helpful because in case there's something we forgot to specify, there's another place to really check about what we actually did. Um, are there any, and I actually have a few slides after this, but hopefully some of them will not be, hopefully it won't take too long. Are there any major points or minor points that I missed that you want to bring up or ask or something? Yeah. So, of course, um, well, that's why you're here. That's good. Uh, that's, that's fair, right? So, let's say I'm doing a uh, like a numerical experiment. Yeah. Right? There's like a sub in, a, in my experiment involved parameters overtly, right? So I'm saying like this is a good model and this is a good choice of value for this model. Okay. Right. Well, if I can't solve the model explicitly, I have to use an iterative procedure. Okay. The iterative procedure also has like things I have to choose, like like yeah, absolutely. To choose, right? And it's and and 
it might matter it what might, those values are. Right? Absolutely. And there may be sub-values of the iterative two that I also have to choose. Right? Absolutely. So, and, I, and I've had it happen where I just have, I mean, if I was to really write down every single parameter I chose, right, there'd be like 100. Right. And so, probably most of these don't matter. Right. So, so, okay. But this is also where like public code comes in. You say, look, you would say, we have to choose a large number of parameters. So you might, you might, you might explicitly describe the number that are there. Yeah. You know, chances are some won't matter very much, others might. We recognize that others will want to experiment with other, th other things. Here's our code. The, the text file will have the list of the parameters. Supplementary information, mm -hmm. right? I agree, listing 100 parameters for almost every person who's reading it is a waste of space. But you have the supplementary information of a text file saying here are the ones we used. So anybody who wants it, it's there. Because anyone who's trying to duplicate the work will need it, right? Because, right, yeah. you know, you know, so so you just so, so that's perfect for a supplement. Even you know, it's perfect for a supplement because it's it's just there. Otherwise, you're going to eventually, you know, ten years later, get an email saying, "What parameter did you choose?" I don't remember. It was ten years ago. <laughs> no, I've, I've I've had emails like that. Um, making sure to knock off that and make that stop. So but okay, so that's harder than others, right? Because that's going to depend. Sometimes it's going to be, you know, there's some reason that scientific. The experimental values, we need to make the data small enough, whatever, right? And you should then, if you have a specific reason, you should just say. Other times you say, okay, look, we have to choose something to have a well-defined problem. We recognize that it's an arbitrary choice. Um, so if it's arbitrary, you should be open about the fact that it's arbitrary, or at least that you think it's arbitrary. Otherwise, you should say why you did it. I think that's important. Um, the example that you gave, I mean, if it involved fiddling, then you would say that it involved fiddling without saying the numbers, but it sounds like it didn't involve fiddling. You just kind of pick stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, so it depends. But, but you, know, you should ask yourself you know, why you chose it. And if it's arbitrary, you can just say, look, we had to choose something, so we choose something. You know, did we do a p-value at 0.05 or 0.01? Okay, p-values, of course, are controversial and so on. It's like, oh, we chose p-value of 0.05 because a lot of our results had 0.03. This would be the overly honest methods <laughs> version. Uh, 0.05 is considered standard, although the p, p if you end up doing a lot of p-values in your papers, you really should read about the good and bad because this has been a bit of a nightmare. Um, but yeah, you know, you do the best you can. Sometimes things will be arbitrary, and then you just say they're arbitrary. Michael, you said you had several questions. You had another couple other no. uh, urgent ones? No. Um, okay. So we're in the same institution. Of course, you are free to ask me at other points and email me and so on. Um, Okay, so here's an exercise. You don't have to literally do it, but I bring it up as an exercise because I think it's genuinely useful. And actually, one of the things that I sometimes do in the networks course, and I didn't do it last year because I felt, I, I felt it, I considered doing it, but I, I, I didn't want to take away time from the projects and so on, so I ended up not doing it. So anyway, pretend you are reviewing a paper and see what you notice. And there's two aspects of this. One, of course, is, you know, is the science right? But the other has to do with the stuff that we discussed earlier, the, the painful to read part. So you want to ask yourself these questions because you need to do this for your own. But it's very hard to do this for your own, for your own draft because, of course, you already know the answer. So even if you didn't succeed in conveying it, you might do that anyway, which is why it's useful to do this for other people, people's papers to, to see if they succeed because it will help you write your own papers. You know, do you, un after reading the relevant parts of their paper, you know, do you understand why they undertook their study? And you may not agree with them, right? You may not agree with their reason, but do you understand why they have that reason? Um, do you understand what is new that they contributed to the literature? Again, you don't have to agree with what they think is new, but you know, do you understand it? Um, is it clear where they will go next? Well, if your goal is to prove Fermat's last theorem, and you prove Fermat's last theorem may or may not be a next, but usually there's next, right? Because usually we run out of time, we graduate, we do whatever, and there are other things, we get bored and we want to work on something else. You know, there, there could have been other stuff that we did that we would have done if we wanted to devote more time. And some of those, not necessarily all of them, are worth mentioning in a paper. And so if you're a reader, you know, are those clear? What are the next steps? Um, Okay, did they take all the technical details and explain them correctly, effectively? This is where the BS part comes in. And honestly, right, there are hypotheses, 
There are, there are places where they departed from rigor. Are they honest about the fact that you know, this method is rigorous, this method is heuristic, and, and whatever. Um, the demands of mathematicians and the demands of others for some of these things tend to be a little different culturally. Go ahead. So how, keep in mind with the sort of no bullshitting, in, in especially honesty, so what do you do if you get a result that you just don't understand? Like you and your co-authors just don't but you, but you But you're convinced it's true. Right, yeah, yeah. You, you, say, say, you say, this result is true, but we, but we still need, but, we, but you, say, you say that the result is true, Right, as long as, as long as it's actually true, you say the result is true. And then you say, um, you know, how, I mean, unfortunately, you know, we either say, unfortunately, we don't have intuition for why it's true. I mean, you can always just not say anything, in which case you'll be asked and then you'll say it anyway. Mm -hmm. So you may as well say, you know, we know that, now if, if it's a minor result, meaning like it's a small part of your paper, you would just assert that it's true as long as you've actually verified it's true and not give details. If it's an important thing, you know, and where the level of importance of the line comes in, who knows, you say, okay, look, we know it's true, we verified it's true, but we don't understand why. Or, or, you know, or we believe it maybe because of blah, but you fr use the word believe, you don't even use words like suggest, mm -hmm. right? So, so there's a paper in which we see certain types of results in models that are related to what's called the Fermi Pasta Ulam um, model, as opposed to other, it's an example of a nonlinear lattice. And, and we see results that are qualitatively rather different from other types of nonlinear lattices. And we believe that the part that we, gen and we have a general version of the FPU, it's a generalization of it. And we believe that certain features of the FPU are probably why a certain thing occurs. So, right, it is a belief. We think, we think that there's a certain part of the model that we generalize that's causing some behavior to be different. We know we observe behavior that's different. We have confirmed that. But, but we have an intuition of this would be why, but we don't really know how to pursue it. Right? So, so we phrase it as we believe it's true, because that's somehow based on our intuition, but it's a belief, right? It's not even, it's not even a heuristic calculation or, or whatever at, at, at that level of the statement. Or you may not even have that. You may just be like, we have no idea why it's true. I wouldn't phrase it that way, but... Well, how would you phrase it? I would, I, I would say, okay, we'd say, I'd say this result is true, but we don't yet have, you know, we, 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 don't, have, we don't yet have a mechanistic understanding of why. Now, or mechanistic, or even intuition. Stephanie. Some, oh, so I want to resonate to that a little bit. So sometimes when we are run, running some algorithm, a lot of times, say for example, if we have a uh, penalty term, and then sometimes we have to decide what is the weight of that penalty term. How, however, normally we don't have a good clue, or we don't have a good strategy of just, deciding just, what are that. It just kind of works. It just kind of works. And then the reason why it works is probably because we try, say, a hundred times with different type of weight. And then one of those 100 right. experiments that works. And then say, that being the case, how can we honestly explain our effort in trying to see if we have a good luck with the parameter? Well, in this particular case, because you also have to worry about, about things like um, you know, genericity and so on, you say, we tried these parameters, mm -hmm. and these particular ones gave successful results. You give both pieces of information because the fact that you actually had to hunt for it, I think, is a relevant part of the science. I see. So you are you are suggesting that even if we don't emphasize how much effort that we need no, but that does emphasize how much effort. Well, it does. That does so emphasize how much you, effort. You didn't mention is it uh, uh, say one out of ten or one out of hundred. No, I did say uh, okay. I would say here the we we tried these. Mm -hmm. These could be, no, no. You you would actually you would actually say if it's a hundred or ten. You would. I see. You would. Because the fact that you had to hunt for it is relevant because somebody else, may, you know, you don't, you don't want them to think it was, you know, you just find it randomly, right? It would be easy yeah. to find. They don't have to go through effort. So clearly some sort of blood, sweat, and tears was involved, and you have to convey that they were involved. Yeah, okay. I saw your hand creep up. So, and then also, supposing there isn't some canonical figure of merit that you're supposed to use to judge your results, how do you, in a, like, you know, in an intellectually honest, right. and, like, sort of reasonable way, and falsifiable way, importantly, report your own figures of merit. So falsifiable way, so you're not going to study string theory then. Um, <laughs> uh, falsifiable is sometimes hard though. I mean, you do the best you can. So how do you judge it? Um, usually you probably can't. I mean, you might have some intuition. Hopefully, hopefully you can convey what your intuition is as to why it's relevant. Um, I mean, you can say the figures of merit you used, they may not be ones that are agreed upon. 
and you can say why you chose the ones that you chose if you don't have a good reason for I mean you may have a good reason and so, or you may think you have a good reason or you may just say there's a bunch of out there here are the ones we did somebody else who's a referee can say you haven't done my favorite one go do it in fact that and it's almost a theorem that that will happen right but but you know so there's a limit to what you can say you can say what you chose. If you have a reason for choosing it, for choosing it, you should say why you chose it. If you don't, you just say we chose this. Although, if the, you know, if you didn't choose something, you might have a reason for not choosing it. If it's uncommon, you probably don't have to say it. If it, you know, if it's if it's common, if something is common but you chose not to do it, um, sometimes you choose something because someone else chose it, which, if you follow that chain, may not have led to a good choice sometimes, but. You know, like sometimes if you're doing a direct comparison with other papers, you just want to use the one they chose yeah. because they chose it because that gives you a direct comparison and whether or not it's the best in some abstract sense, at least it's the best for that comparison. Um, so the answer to your question is not easy. Mm. It's not the same for every paper. Um, falsifiable is something we always want but it's not always possible. I mean, m we're usually okay with the stuff that we're studying but like, you know, Someone who's doing climate science, some stuff is less falsifiable than others, right? Because they don't have as many systems to test on. So, so you can't demand it for every situation either because not every, not, every, not every subject has the same level of natural experiments. And yeah, string theory. String theory is beautiful math. I think it's mostly math, not physics though. Now I'm gonna get more hate mail, but. Um, okay, so figures easy, to, clear and easy to understand. Is there anything crucial missing? The reason I have this question is, well, to make sure there's nothing crucial missing in my slide, the reason I have this question is there might be something that doesn't necessarily go into any of these other categories, but somehow you feel that they should have addressed something in the paper, and this may be a qualitative thing, and it may be different based on different opinions. Um, and you should also think about what they did well. Okay, so we're focusing on criticism because, you know, this is me, but, um, you know, what did the authors do well, both for science and for writing, and what did they do poorly? Now, this question is more interesting in a sense. How would you have done things differently? When you're a referee, if the only thing you can complain about is that they didn't make the choices that you would have made, well, they're the ones who wrote the paper, right? But when you are evaluating it, not as the referee, but from somebody who also wants to make your choices for your own paper, even if there's nothing technically wrong, if they made a different choice from you, that's also kind of relevant if you're working on a similar material for your own papers. Um, of course, all of you will, maybe some of you already have, gotten referee reports where the main complaint ends up being that you happen to make different choices than they would have. And if they can justify right and wrong, that's one thing. But if it's just different, like I have, you know, I have my own preferences for sentence structure and grammar and so on. And when I'm co-authoring a paper, I try to you know, you know, get as many of these to be in the final paper as possible. But unless it's an issue of correctness, if I'm just refereeing a paper, if I'm not the author, I should not be imposing it in the same way. I shouldn't impose it as an author either, but I have strong opinions. Um, anyway, um, we are getting close to six, so I'm not sure if we should really do more of this at this point, because you've been very good about questions. Uh, Twitter people can, or whoever in the, in, the, in the online multiverse, can give me polite comments. Polite. Uh, this, is, this is why I don't engage in conversations on social media, because they don't, um, no. But um, I have friends out there in the world. You may have questions. Hopefully this will be useful for you. Um, if there are like resources that I could add to the slides, you know, I could add a couple slides of other things of good writing. So, so Michael, you mentioned a good source, but there's also other stuff there. And I'm sure there are points I missed, although as I said, you folks have been good about asking questions. Oh yeah, a couple other resources, because I added these. I, these were not in the one two weeks ago. Okay, this one, the scientific paper is obsolete. Here's what's next. Okay, this title's obnoxious. <laughs> right. Like, when I say don't do BS, I actually think that this kind of, uh, granted, it's a, you know, it's a magazine rather than a journal. I don't like the title, but I believe that there are useful things that are in this article. Like the fact that things like Jupyter notebooks could be added to papers to really help people learn stuff. You don't learn stuff from static figures. You learn stuff, you know, like, you know, in more dynamic ways. What's that? Interesting. Yeah. So obnoxious title aside, I think it is worth looking at this. Um, 
I've never actually looked at this, but Nick Hayam, um, you know, is well he's well respected, obviously as a scientist, but but also in terms of a, as a writer. I have not looked in the book, so I cannot say anything about the book, but it's there. Um, and then I had some comments, and I expect I'll get other comments. Thank you for your comments. Okay, so I hope this helps. That's what I want because that's the point. I want you to write fantastic papers. Sounds like you're well on your way. Some of you I know are well on your way because I've read drafts of those papers. Um, and yes, this is not just for applied math, but I was trying to help to add that bit concrete. Okay, now I truly am done. All right. And uh, you know, we will we will all we will all talk more and it's you know Friday evening and I'm tired. <laughs>